to welcome everybody to another exciting Friday afternoon Chala. Um, I am extremely happy to welcome three speakers today. Um, hence, I already announced I will be short and focused with the introductions because we have so many things to talk about. Let me first welcome Silvia Hirsch, who is a professor of anthropology at the Universidad Nacional de San Martín also the author of El Pueblo Taipiete de Argentina, Historia y Cultura. Second, we have with us Paula Canova, who is an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Texas at Austin, and the author of Frontier Intimacies, Ayoreo Women and the Sexual Economy of the Paraguayan Chaco. Then, Welcome, please, Mercedes Bioca, um, researcher at the Escuela Interdisciplinaria de Altos Estudios Sociales at the Universidad de San Martín in Argentina also. This will be a session uh, titled The Chaco Region of South America, Interdisciplinary Perspectives on a Changing Social and Environmental Landscape. It is also a celebration of the publication of a new edited volume, and we have the editors and authors with us here who will introduce the book. So I am handing over also asking people to please remember to during the uh, presentations, um, put your um, voice on mute and uh, make sure that we can understand the presentations. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And first of all, we would like to thank uh, Marcela Vasquez and also uh, Jadwika for this opportunity to be here, to be there <laughs> in, uh, in a way, to be there in Arizona and to be able to present our book and our research. And uh, we would like to give a brief introduction to, to our book and also to Achaco, and then we will give specific presentations on our research and our, uh, our specific chapters on the book. This, the idea of this book came about in 2016. We, the three of us were together at, at the Congress, the American Anthropological Association meetings uh, in Minneapolis. And it was the first time we had a panel ever on the Chaco region. The Chaco region is this enormous, vast territory of almost a million hectares in Paraguay, Bolivia, Argentina, and a small portion of Brazil. It's really an enormous um, territory. And it's not as known, you could say, as the Amazon, for instance. These are lowlands. It's a, it's a lowland region. And so we thought it was extremely important to visibilize it and to write uh, in English, for also in, for English speakers. There's a lot published in the Chaco. And it had been 20 years since an edited volume in English on the Chaco had been published. So we thought this was a, a, an opportunity to, to again show the research we've been doing. And also what we thought about is writing in a very collaborative way. And by this, we mean working with uh, scholars of Latin America as well. So the book includes authors from the United States, from pa uh, Paraguay, Bolivia, and Argentina and in this way uh, collaborate, but also it's very interdisciplinary. So we have anthropologists and sociologists and people who don't do linguistics and geography development. So you know, to, to show different perspectives was, uh, was also our interest. And I wanted to show, can I share, I wanna share screen one second? Let me know if you can see, can you see this? Sure. So this is the cover of our book. Uh, called Reimagining the Gran Chaco Identities, Politics, and the Environment in, in South America. And uh, just this is not very clear, maybe, but we wanted just to show a little bit about the chapters and the variety of themes that we're covering. Uh, we have chapters on his, history or ethno history of uh, Chaco groups and on the geography of, of the region, on interethnic relations, on religion, both shamanic and evangelical religion on gender, on territory extractivism. So we're trying to cover those, those themes that have been at the core of research in the Chaco. I was mentioning this vast territory. I hope you can see more or less the map. 
of, of this, this huge area that covers, again, three countries. And we've been thinking about the, the Chaco in this transnational sense, in a sense that this is a region that covers so many countries and the differences about what happened in, happens in those countries. And here, uh, these, uh, the, these shapes are the indigenous groups covered in the book, which doesn't mean that they're all the indigenous, there's more, many more indigenous groups in the Chaco, but these are the ones covered here in the book. And just to give you a sense of the diversity of, of groups and of areas we've been trying to, to address in this publication. So just to give you a sense of this vastness of indigenous peoples, non-indigenous peoples, colonists from different nationalities, frontier expansion, there are many themes involved in, in the book and Paola will continue now with some of those major themes that we, we covered. Uh -huh. So thank you, Silvia, and, and thanks everyone for being here. It's wonderful to be able to to be in a space of, of the University of Arizona again, even though it's virtually. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to give you just a bit of a general historical uh, aspect that is and how some of the cha chapters weave into it uh, about the Chaco. So since colonial uh, times, the Chaco has been known for being constructed as wild and outside the realm of the state. And territorial control over the region has been a source of dispute since independence of Argentina, Bolivia, and Paraguay. And this has led to several geographic and scientific explorations to claim uh, or assert claims over the region. And similarly to the Southwest of the US and Mexico, and, and this is something that also my mentor at Arizona, Tom Sheridan, talks about uh, this in one of his books, the ecological landscape, weather conditions, and the perceived hostilities of indigenous groups frustrated the advance of Spaniards for centuries in the, into the Gran Chaco, impending military efforts, missionary campaigns, and the formation of non-indigenous uh, settlements. By the 18th century, Franciscan and Jesuits established mission in Bolivia and the Argentine Chaco. Um, and the Jesuit uh, missions were short-lived short due to their expulsion in six, uh, 1767. During the 19th and 20th century, you have more incursions into the region, uh, travelers, explorers, providing rich accounts of the environment and the people. And especially during the 20th century, we have important work of ethnographers laying the groundwork for understanding the complex ethno-history of the, of the area. And among them, Nordeskol, Metro, and Susnik. And drawing from some of these works, the chapter by Brett Gustafsson, for example, engages in a historical and linguistic account of the complexity of ethnogenesis and the influence of colonial discourse in the making of history, indigenous history. He explores this in the context of Bolivia, engaging in a critical examination of the emergence of the Guarani people, historically known as Chiriguano. Rodrigo Villagra, a Paraguayan author in the book, also draws from the ethnohistorical record to explore the ethnographic cartographies of the Chaco. He reveals the dialectical transformations that are subjacent to the variation of ethnonyms and languages throughout the history of the Chaco. What he does is he draws on the death ritual of an Angaite friend and collaborator of him to show how the Angaite people of Paraguay for them, rituals are the result of their complex ethnogenesis, but also shaped by interactions with diverse indigenous and non-indigenous groups. The geopolitical borders between the three, the three countries were only established starting after the, the War of the Triple Alliance, uh, which ended in 1870. Large part of the Paraguayan territory at that time was sold to land speculators, mainly British, US, and Argentine companies that, raised, uh, uh, that bought, bought those lands to raise livestock and create timber mills on the banks of the Paraguay River. Uh, meanwhile, at that time Argentina and Bolivia were developing a lot of infrastructure in the region. And the advancement of the missionary frontier is another important component, historical component that, that, that most of the chapters in the book somehow refer to it in one way or another, and the impact that this process of missionization had on indigenous peoples. Uh, the work of Seriani Cernadas 
shows, for example, how missionization reorganized Wixi and Com communities of the Argentinian Chaco, um, how uh, mission stations created new, new, new places and restructured uh, indigenous subjectivities by defining uh, or, or implementing notions of hygiene and development. And the author also shows how religious missions initially occupied a role in education and health and how that was later taken by the, that role by the state. And in doing so, humanitarianism and hygienic practices configure what he calls a cosmology of development in the region. In the Paraguayan Chaco, we have the Russian descent Mennonites who formed four colonies between 1927 and 47. And one of the, our authors, Hannes Kalish, uh, shows how the arrival of Mennonite settlers imply not only a process of dispossession, but also a shift in enclave ontologies. And, and he shows this as narrated uh, by an enclave elder in his chapter. He also examines how inter-ethnic relations constructed notions of territory and territorial possession in the context of Mennonite settling the region. It must, it must be said that although the Catholic Church has had a longer presence in the region, currently the majority of individuals, um, indigenous peoples mostly belong to Protestant denominations. And just to finish uh, drawing on a more contemporary context, the chapter of Celia, which she will present on today, takes a transnational perspective to look at how the Tapiete of Paraguay and Bolivia construct and experience a multi-territorial dynamic in which geopolitical borders are challenged and identities are uh, uh, in relation to evangelical membership are being redefined. Uh, thank you, Mercedes. Thank you, Paola, and thank you everyone for being here. I will briefly mention another of the main topic of our book, which is neo-extractivism and the profound and multiple changes it has provoked. In the last decades, the expansion of agribusiness and cattle ranching activities have submitted the forest of the Grand Chaco region to the largest and most accelerated devastation on record. Nowadays, this region is one of the areas in the world where the impact of global warming is being amplified and made more severe because of those changes. The dramatic piece of deforestation has also exacerbated the process of urbanization in which indigenous people come to inhabit marginal spaces in urban towns and cities, forcing them to become dependent for survival on sporadic wage labor, labor activities. In this context, indigenous women are the most marginalized and excluded people as Paola shows in her work. Hydrocarbon exploration and mining activities have also shaped Gran Chaco in new ways. Especially since the arrival of the pink tide government, the tensions between the project of national development based on the extraction of natural resources and policies intended to recognize indigenous people's rights have increased. As Denise Bevington and Guido Cortez show in their chapter on Bolivia entitled Tense territories negotiating natural gas in Venayek society. Denise and Guido explore the process of consultation and how complex relations between indigenous groups, state officials, and gas companies are shaping, shaping the livelihoods of the Venayek people. Nancy Postero work entitled The Warani People. The struggle for indigenous autonomy in Bolivia also analyzed this tension, but from a different perspective. She showed how the Guarani of Charagua are strategically using the rights established in the new constitution to move towards the long-term goal of rebuilding the Guarani nation. Besides this tension, the boom of extractive industry also brought deep transformation in the landscapes and social relations because of the infrastructure projects such as highways, railway, and aqueducts, which were in many cases financed by international organizations. These projects seek, seek to facilitate the flow of commodities resulting from destructive economic activities in the region, which has stimulated a renewed interest in the resources, but not necessarily in the people who live there. 
While the new infrastructure serves the objective of the company, it also implies a strong control and limitation of, over the everyday life of indigenous people. In Paraguay, asset communities have been subject to multiple dispossession because of the expansion of cattle ranchers' activities, as Joel Correa showed in his work entitled Infrastructure of Settled Colonialism. In this context, these communities were forced to occupy the only land in the area not designated as proper private property, which was at the margin of a highway. Living condition on the side of the road undermined the basic human rights of the community members. So drawing on Tanya Lee's concept of institutional violence, Joel considers how the highway and the ranch fences that border the community have been sources of violence and political possibility for ethnic people. Finally, several chapters in the book also show how people in Chaco region are subject to increasing level of toxicity produced by the fumigation of soybean fields or by the contaminated water of stock ponds on cattle ranches. But they also show how indigenous people are crucial actors in resisting these landscapes of this possession. Although indigenous people's perception and position on extractive industries are far from being homogeneous, as I have tried to show in my chapter entitled Between Resistance and Acquiescence, which I will present next. I don't know if uh, I, I can share the, the screen to, to do my presentation of the chapter. Um, can you see this? Yes. Great. So my chapter entitled Between Resistance and, and Acquiescence deals with some of the tensions and conflicts linked to soybean expansion that the province of Chaco experienced between mid-1990s and the first decade of 2000. During that period, thousands of hectares of bush were cleared and planted with soybean. Sorry. Some of these plots were part of the forest where some indigenous groups used to forage for food. In other cases, they belong to Criollo farmers who produce cotton mainly for the domestic market and hire indigenous peoples as cotton pickers. When the soya boom started, these lands were seen that by businessmen as valuable spaces in which to expand the agribusiness frontier. In few years, extensive areas have been opened and incorporated into the new market. Academic and popular accounts tend to characterize this era of dispossession by its high level of conflict. However, contrary to what is suspected, many of these regions can be crossed without seeing in them any act of resistance. So we need to ask, how do people perceive and experience the process of accumulation by dispossession? How can we explain the absence of conflict in this sacrifice zone? These are some of the main questions that guide my work. So similarly to other studies on rural transformation, I use the concept of accumulation by dispossession to explain the main features of the process that is reshaping the rural areas in Argentina. As other authors have noted, one of the most persuasive aspects of the, that concept is that it provides an explanation of the connection between global and local processes. However, in my opinion, one of the main limitations lies in the fact that its political nature has been blurred. In general terms, we could say that the mechanism by which Accumulation by dispossession occurs emphasize almost exclusively the action of dominant groups, while the perception and actions of subaltern groups are almost always relegated to the status of an opposing reaction after the event. In my work, I argue that the process of accumulation by dispossession should not be understood only as a project uniformly implemented from above on people who exist more or less successfully, 
but as a process which is perceived, experienced, and acted on differently by different groups according to their local rationalities. So drawing on Nielsen and, and Cox, I understand the local rationalities on which people base their action as a specific configuration shaped by their, their memories on resistance and negotiation from past period, also by their actual experiences of this possession, and finally by their position of subalternity. This dimension of analysis are central because they allow us to understand what types of resistance arise, what aspect of the process cause resistance, as well as why some groups do not mobilize. Now, I will briefly discuss two examples of the various ways in which the soya bean expansion was perceived by two different indigenous groups. So let me now introduce to my first case, which is the case of the Mokobi people at Paraje Las Tolderías. The story of this colony started in 1911 when a group of Mokobi people was forced to migrate, migrate from Santa Fe province to the south of Chaco as a consequence of the advance of the National Army. In 1924, they finally settled in the territory which belonged to an agricultural colony created by the national government a few years earlier. The region was one of the main cotton producing centers in Chaco. So the Mokoi who lived there were from the beginning surrounded by small and mid-sized producers with whom they established good relations. Given that they have a very limited access to land, indigenous people became day laborers and harvesters in the field of the Criollo colonies. And until the mid 90s, 80s, this was the main source of support for the Mokobi family. Since the mid 90s, 90s, a group of businessmen people from Cordoba province started to rent and buy fields from Criollo farmers, progressively replacing cotton crops with soybean. The departure of the old Criollo colonies and the introduction of soybean have led to major changes in the rural dynamic of the area, such as lack of employment, increased pollution, and limitation on hunter-gatherer practices. However, this community has not seen protests against, against the soybean expansion. So to understand why there is no resistance, I propose to turn to Mokoid memories of the previous era. In this community, the cotton period, which coincided with the arrival at the new settlement, was remembered as a time of happiness and abundance. The enthusiasm that characterized the memories of the cotton period is in clear contrast to the previous period of austerity. In almost all the accounts, the regular money they obtained from their work in the cotton harvest was a central element in explaining the well-being experience during that period. This money gave them the possibility not only of overcoming the crisis, but also allowed them to have access to certain goods and places such as bar where they came into closer contact with Rioja community. It is important to notice that apart from the salary, uh, the prosperity of this year depended on the material help they received from the Rioja colonies. For the Mokobi, the neoliberal restructuring meant above all the loss of their old shops and the help they had received from their Criollo colonies. However, the fact that the Criollo colonies were the first to be affected as they were the one who were forced to sell their land meant that the process and its consequences were perceived by the Mokobi as something inevitable. In this case, the new rural dynamics, although caused significant changes, did not alter their practices entirely. Essentially, even though they need uh, they now need to migrate to other provinces, they still are seasonal workers. I, move, I will move on to my second case in which the soybean expansion was followed by resistance. In this case, we found that at the end of 19th century, the Kong community in Pampa del Indio was forced to work in tanning industry and sugar cane plantations that had been established in the region. Given the importance of these industries, 
to the economy, the national government granted the COM community a temporary occupation permit as a way of guarantee its labor force. Decades later, the settlement of Criollos from other provinces resulted in the expulsion of numerous COM families. This dispossession was partially reversed in the mid 1940s during the cotton period, when the national government, trying to confront the oligarchy, decided to expropriate large and mid-sized establishments. In this process, some Kong families receive plots of 25 or 50 hectares, and they become cotton producers. They also receive training and tools from the government. These policies forge a new kind of relationship of loyalty and dependence between the state and the Kong. The implementation of neoliberal policies, especially from the, from, sorry, the 1990s, which imply a cut in public expenditure and as a consequence, the elimination of support for cotton production led many cotton farmers to sell, sell their land. In a context of severe economic crisis and stagnation, a company, Don Panos, bought trucks on, of land and started to produce soybean. The setup of the company required a huge deforestation in the area and the deviation of the Bermejo River to feed the company's irrigation system. So for the Kong families, the establishment of this company implied a reduction in the possibility for foraging, the loss of seasonal work, and an increasing difficulty in producing their own cotton because of the scarcity of water and the pollution produced by the company. Uh, in this new context, contrary to my previous case, the COM community made a lot of complaints to the state. So to understand, I will turn to, Mokoit, to COM, sorry, memories uh, of the previous era. So many COM who live in Pampa del Indio describe the cotton period as a time when they started to work as they should do. Because they were not only workers, they became producers as well. And in their memories, the proliferation of cotton producer is linked to the state intervention, which is reflected in people's memories of following up. The idea of following up or seguimiento referred to the training and supervision carried out by the expert from the state program. So Combs account of this period demonstrates a different process of integration comparing with the Mokoit. Inclusion here occur mainly through the help given by the state rather than through the Criollo colonies. These relationships shape the way in which this possession is perceived and dealt with. My conversation with Tom about the problems they face uh, today, they rarely started out with the mention of the conflict with Don Panos. In most cases, the narratives were focused primarily on the absence of the state and the lack of support for working in the fields. In this community, the new rural dynamics are seen as a consequence of the change in the role of the state. And this absence of the state is perceived as something that affects exclusively indigenous people. They believe that the state has ceased to recognize them as producers. Thus the lack of, of state support for the continuity of cotton production uh, became the main foci of their demands and claims. So finally, to summarize, we can agree that dominant groups and state play a crucial role in both backing and promoting this process of dispossession. However, the political nature of these processes required that we also consider how these processes are perceived, experienced, and acted upon by, super, by subaltern groups. That is why in my chapter, I argue that a focus on local rationalities provides a more suitable starting point for understanding this transformation. Thank you. Thank you, Paola. Sí. Yes, if you can. Yeah, I will try to, let me, I don't know how to, I am. Here. Paula, do I show the PowerPoint? Yes, you, you're going, uh, yes. you just okay. let me know and. Okay, perfecto. Go ahead. No, no está todavía puesto. Sí está. No están. Sí está. ¿Cómo? Sí está. 
Can you see it? Eh, no, no puedo yes. ver, pero ok. Ah, ya, yeah, ok. Un momento, por favor. Mm, okay, so uh, so what I want so so what I do in my chapter is I I start off following the ordeal of a young Ayoreo woman called Baela who's seeking medical access in the Mennonite colonies of the Central Chaco, Paraguayan Chaco, and then in Asuncion. And fa failure to receive that treatment led to her premature death at 35. And I tell her story because uh, uh, I believe that it is not an isolated case, but rather a reality that is frequently experienced by many indigenous peoples fr from the Chaco when, when seeking access to health services. And I, I felt that this is an issue that demands a critical evaluation of the much celebrated intercultural reform of the health system, a process that has been going on in Paraguay since the late 2000s. And, and also uh, something that I want wanted to do in this chapter is bring a bit of the history of, of the multicultural reforms that Paraguay experienced. So in the scholarship, we hear a lot about how this process happened in other countries, uh, how neoliberal reforms came hand in hand with multicultural reforms. But Paraguay was, estuvo siempre como que en, en el shade. No escuchamos mucho of, of what, how it happened in Paraguay. And this process in Paraguay actually started later. Uh, you have Brazil already making multicultural reforms in the 80s, uh, Bolivia uh, reacting to neoliberal multiculturalism in the 90s. And in Paraguay, the process starts uh, with the fall of the dictatorship of Stroessner in 89. Um, and these reforms were uh, uh, introduced along, neoliberal reforms introduced along multicultural pro state programs as well. So what I do is I explore how multiculturalism is experienced uh, today in Paraguay as a contemporary form of governance. And a multicultural citizenship is constructed, uh, I say, by colliding agendas that reproduce colonial hierarchies that in turn continue to exclude indigenous peoples from access in state resources in, and services. Siguiente. I draw an experience of Ayoreo women in the Chaco to examine how the reform of the health system plays out at the local level. And while health uh, policies promote ethnic diversity and inclusion, the experience of Ayoreo uh, people living in the context of the colonies reveals how health providers engage in these courses and practices that actually seek to regulate women's uh, bodies and finally limit their access to health prevention and treatment treatment programs. Also interactions between governmental health professionals and young Ayoreo women in Philadelphia shows how bio, biomedical discourses eh, reveal radical disparities in the exercise of multicultural citizenship for indigenous women as proclaimed by the state. Siguiente, ah no, este es Silvia, que da, eh, el, el anterior es. In 2008, eh, there, uh, a reform uh, was uh, uh, an important reform uh, regarding indigenous issues was set in motion. It took place when ex Bishop Fernando Lugo took power, uh, ending 61 years of unbroken domination by the conservative Colorado party. And although his presidency was short lived, he fostered a series, a series of broad social reforms, of which the restructuring of the healthcare system was, was one of his priorities. El siguiente, Silvia, uno más. A national uh, policy on indigenous health was outlined and passed as a law, and the goals included, among other things, understanding how indigenous perceptions of health problems, uh, what, what are those perceptions, improving patient physician interactions, and the application of culturally sensitive treatments. And a formal dependency within the Ministry of Health was also created at that time in 2008 uh, to attend indigenous health issues. Siguiente. 
Sí, 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 Inception, the official eh, national policy on indigenous health has been a collaborative effort in consultation with members of different indigenous groups and non-indigenous representatives from civil society. These representatives included uh, uh, members of international cooperation agencies, seven, members of seven NGOs, and also the Catholic Church. So while neoliberal, uh, uh, neoliberalism values the strengthening and participation of civil so, uh, society and a priori it seems like compatible with indigenous culture, cultural priorities. In the Paraguayan case, this type of multisectorial collaboration has had a detrimental effect on uh, of fostering high levels of dependency of indigenous peoples in relation to NGOs or on NGOs, pre precluding the claim autonomy celebrated in the policy itself. So unlike countries like, like Bolivia or Brazil, where there is a long history of indigenous activism, uh, indigenous participation in Paraguay in state affairs continues to be highly mediated by non-indigenous members of civil society. Siguiente. At the local level, eh, at the local level in the Chaco, eh, the multicultural reform of the health system eh, reached eh, that region also around 2009, more or less, through a program program called the Centralization of Health and Community Participation. This program was funded by US, USAID and the initiative fostered the formation of Consejos Locales de Salud, local health councils, through which local authorities would uh, receive, manage state or private funds and implement governmental health policies. In the case of Philadelphia, which is the main urban center of the Mennonite Fernheim colony, the municipality of Philadelphia uh, has operated through its consejo to create the health post called Amistad, which is a small clinic which offers subsidized health services and medical supplies for the local population. Siguiente. In the second part of the chapter, what I do is I explore how the Ayoreo eh, experience these policies eh, as they are implemented on the ground. The Ayoreo have been foragers until the mid 60s when they were sedentarized mostly by eh, US based neutralized missionaries. And today they seek mostly medical attention in the Mennonite colonies. As I said in the introduction to the Chaco, this colony specifically this one was formed in 1930 by Russian descent Mennonites. And, 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 and the Mennonite colonies became a very important economic hub in the central Chaco, especially after the 1990s. And concomitant with this uh, uh, economic development of the region, uh, Ayoreo people, uh, specifically women, uh, experienced the commodification of their sexuality of young single women, uh, which, are, uh, which are called Curajodie eh, is a term that used by Ayoreo to refer by single women who monetize sexual liaison with non-Ayoreo men, mostly in the colonies. And these women approach intimate liaisons in their own terms. They initiate courting and flirting. They don't see their involvement, the involvement of money as morally problematic, but rather as constitutive of sexual encounters. Non-Ayoreo people perceive women's practices as sex work. However, the monetization of women's sexuality is neither new nor understood to a sex work by Ayoreo. And, and this is something that I explore more, more broadly in my, in my book, Frontier Intimacies, which I invite you to read. And, and uh, uh, but, but this uh, uh, commodification of sexuality is constitutive of women's, young women's uh, uh, sexual exchange in the last uh, two decades. Siguiente, por favor. The fact that Ayoreo people do not see this as a moral issue creates tension uh, with the non-indigenous community, more specifically with local health providers, most of who belong to the Mennonite Christian community. On moral grounds, they, uh, young women are denied access to health treatments. Uh, they mostly, uh, their ages range between 24, um, 
sorry, 14 and 28 years, and they are constantly exposed to sexually transmitted infections, client violence, rape, and other health-related issues. Unwanted pregnancies, for example, are also another major social problem. And there is a generalized lack of access to health-related information and no efforts on the part of local health providers to approach the issue with uh, education or, pro uh, or prevention programs. Siguiente. After several trips with some of these young women to seek medical attention, I witnessed multiple occasions where they would face explicit practices of racism and discrimination. For example, in daily encounters with health providers, stereotypical perceptions of them, of, of their cultural traits were deployed to man to, to manipulate and, and replace Ayoreo notions of self-care self and health. Hygiene was a major point of contention frequently mentioned by the staff. And in addition to openly making discriminatory remarks, which constructed these young women as ignorant or dirty, health providers also repeatedly encouraged women to become responsible and engage in basic hygiene practices as a prerequisite to receive medical attention. So, so this insistence on self-discipline is also very consistent with new forms of neoliberal citizenship. And to become what scholars Briggs and Haley have termed sanitary citizens, that is individuals who discipline their own bodies and become actively aware of the health and disease of their bodies in terms of medical epistemologies. Ayoreo women were required oftentimes to follow not only routines of hygiene, but also undergo regular checkups, medications, and family planning. Siguiente, por favor. So the chapter presents several uh, examples of interactions between Ayoreo women and health providers showing how the latter set the terms of access to care by mingling medical concerns with moral debates of what they consider proper relations of gender. They do this unaware of the cultural nuances and larger socioeconomic processes that drive young women's decisions. And a major failure of these healthcare reforms in the region is that programs only target uh, uh, indigenous people, do not actually target health officials. They don't receive any, any type of adequate training on cross-cultural health-related aspects in order to offer better and more comprehensive treatments. Siguiente. Ayoreo in general, and women in particular, aware of the expectations, navigate on their own terms the discrimination that they experience when seeking access to health services. While healthcare providers insist on disciplining Ayoreo bodies, women engage in practices to circumvent uh, control and hierarchies, uh, hierarchical medical regimes. They tactic, tactic seek medical attention in other clinics when they feel mistreated or un unhappy with the attention given to them, and others reflect doctors' authority by not learning medication compliance. In doing so, they are challenging some of the established power dynamics, although, although with negative consequences to their health being, well-being. Uh, siguiente, por favor. As a way of conclusion, it can be said that the new healthcare structure in place, a part of the multicultural reform of the state in Paraguay, has involved important progress at the level of policy making. In, the, in this sense, the creation of a specific health department for indigenous affairs, health affairs, and the elaboration of a comprehensive national indigenous plan on health with indigenous participation can be said to be a noteworthy no advance. Uh, its application, however, is still fractured and incomplete. And indigenous participation is welcome only as long as it does not alter pre-established governmental models of ethnic participation. Usually these are expressed by having indigenous peoples attend workshops to craft diagnostic reports and perform their dances and rituals in health related uh, conferences. Beyond this level of participation, indigenous peoples have no active part or are, in, or are uh, becoming an actors of the health system. Rather, health officials and NGOs continue to mediate the role um, 
continue to mediate that role and define access to services at the local level. While what is clear is that the multicultural reforms have in no way yet altered the racialized power structure still in place. In reality, uh, this is a reality that is seen day to day in the relations with, between providers and the patients. Repeated failed attempts of turning Ayoreo women into biomedical subjects uh, translates into ostracizing and, and discriminative practices against them in health uh, posts. Even as the local debate between healthcare providers and local authorities on what should be done with Ayoreo young women continues today into 2021, the health situation of these young women continues to worse due to the exclusionist attitudes and practices that remain unattended under the banner of multicultural reforms being fostered by the Paraguayan state. Thank you. Thank you. So the last, um, the last presentation. Um, one second, I'm going to exit here. Uh, I will present the last paper. Share screen in a second. Is that okay? Can you see it? See. Si. So what I want to share with you uh, here is my research in the last almost 20 years with a, a very small indigenous group reduced, I mean, in size called the Tapiete. In fact, it's so reduced that many people don't know about them in, in, in Argentina at least. In fact, it's so small in, in Argentina, it's about 800 people. In, in Paraguay, much more, 2,000 and about less than 200 in, in uh, sorry, in Paraguay, 2,000 and in Bolivia, about 200. And what I'm interested in is looking at how the Tapiete have forged relations and alliances across the border because they are, they are a trinational, uh, trinational group of indigenous peoples. Here's the map that we saw before, just to show you where they live and to get that sense of territory that I will be uh, talking about. So the Tapite that I work mostly are here in northern, this is northern Argentina. This is a river that separates Paraguay and Argentina. They live here in Paraguay. Uh, they're called Guaranyandea in, in the case of Paraguay. And here, in the Bolivian Chaco. So you have the same indigenous population in three countries. It happens with other indigenous groups as well, but I will talk specifically about that tapiete. So they live in these three countries. They migrated originally. They're originally from Bolivia, from South Bolivia, from the Chaco region of Bolivia. They migrated to Argentina almost a hundred years ago. Um, maybe between 160 and uh, 50 years ago to work in, in Argentina. And they have also migrated for different causes that we'll see now to, to Paraguay as well. And what I'm interested in looking at is what narratives and imaginaries and practices have they forged as a group to maintain a sense of collectivity when you have a small reduced group of people in three countries. So in which ways have their transnational relations with the Tapiete of Paraguay and Bolivia expanded their sense of territory? And what is the real also role of the state and its institutions in guaranteeing the livelihood of the Tapiete? And I, I sustain that they have resorted to the evangelical church. We mentioned before the importance of missionization and churches among Chaco groups. And the, the evangelical church has been a source of support of community cohesion. It provides a sense of continuity, a sense of identification across the border as a common idiom in this transnational and trinational connections. So I will also look at this notion of multi-territoriality to understand these different ways of inhabiting uh, different countries. And so what happens with the Tapite and other indigenous groups is at the same time you have deep territorialization and re-territorialization, the sense of loss of territory for many people and others claiming new territory, settling in new territory. So space, uh, the notion of space is something that's very constitutive of social relations, 
then I'm looking at these different forms of, of inhabiting territory. So it can be individual properties, communal communities, rural communities. It can be a neighborhood in the city, like in the case of the Argentine Tapiete in the middle of the city, new lands, very small, maybe 10 hectares of land that they settle in or vast or more vast territory like in the case of Paraguay. So there's these diverse ways of living and inhabiting territories. There are to me uh, four turning points in Tapiete life and some of them we already mentioned that also um, took place in the lives of many indigenous Chaco people. Uh, these turning points are this massive migration from Bolivia to Argentina as I told you, maybe 100 years ago and 60, 50 years ago, mostly to work in sugarcane plantations. This happened with many other groups that migrated. The Guarani migrated, the Benayek, also known as Wichi. Many highland groups migrated to Argentina to work in sugarcane plantations and, in, and also harvest. The Chaco War, which was a terrible war in 1932 between Paraguay and Bolivia. The Chaco War meant that hundreds of Tapiete were taken from Bolivia to Paraguay as prisoners uh, or, or forced to leave because of the war and settled in Paraguay. Then what I mentioned of evangelism as a turning point of conversion and what conversion means in the lives of people, you know, abandoning their previous way of life, uh, abandoning in many cases the language as well, the new form of of socialization. And the last point is the process of urbanization. So these were people that did not live in urban centers and now are living in a very reduced uh, community of four blocks. That's all the space, five blocks at the most. So those are the processes that really influenced the Tapiet. I'm showing this photograph, which is a very sad photograph taken in 1935 by a German ethnographer in Paraguay, showing two Tapiete men during the process, you know, at the, and the end of the war, you know, the, 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 the impact of the, a war on the indigenous peoples. Again, what I mentioned of, of the presence, very, very strong presence of evangelism, and we're talking about massive conversion of the community and the process of urbanization, which meant losing territory. And it meant losing the territory to cultivate, to have their own uh, plantations and, and, and make a livelihood. And that was also completely lost. And so what's been happening also in the last few years in Argentina, at least, which are crowded, overcrowded in this very small neighborhood of five blocks, is that they're taking and claiming other territories. They're settling in, in other lands, very small, maybe by exchanges, negotiations, different ways of, of occupying territory. Uh, here's a group of men that they're building a completely new community. I mean, there was not, basically nothing there. Uh, and they negotiated these lands. This is only about 12 hectares, it's really small. And asking another indigenous group to you know, allow them to stay there and trying building a new community to be able to practice agriculture, to have space where they could they can leave, uh, live. This is on the other side of the border in Paraguay. And in Paraguay, there's different settlements in which they live. One is Santa Teresita, which is um, ex-mission, you could call it Catholic mission. And there's three, four indigenous groups living there in this large mission. And then there's a, a even larger territory called Laguna Negra which is new, basically 20, 30 years old. It, 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 it was purchased basically by the Mennonites and the Catholic Church and an NGO and they bought land and indigenous people moved into this territory and now there's about 14 Tapiete communities living here in this new territory, you know, in this new sense. And while I was walking there with a Tapiete woman who talked, Barani Andeva, as they call them Paraguay, she took me there, we were walking, we see a group of elderly men sitting there. And so they invite me to talk to them. And we're talking and they say, where are you from? I say Argentina and I say, oh, you know, I, I know Argentina, my relatives live in, in Argentina, I've been there many times. They visited us here. And what you hear about is these constant transnational connections 
and travels to the other side of the border, many times with excuse of having an evangelical campaign. And what people really want to do is meet their relatives on the other side of the border and time also have marriages across the border, but really connect in this transnational sense, which really empowers a very small group to see each other in this sense of we live in this vast territory in the sense that before we didn't have borders. Borders are a new construct, construction of the nation state imposed on, on them and that they see this vast uh, territory in which they can cross the border, meet with the rel relatives, have, especially in the Paraguayan case and also in Bolivia, vast, vast, vast territory, a place to live, a place to live uh, and to cultivate the land and to have a livelihood in, in, a, in a different way. In these transnational connections, it's so interesting. Uh, this is a, pic, a photo taken from Facebook, from this man in the middle, his Facebook. And this is a flag of Paraguay. This is a visit of Guarani and from Paraguay to Argentina for an evangelical campaign. And they're visiting each other. Here's a Paraguayan art uh, playing um, evangelical music with these instruments. But this sense of visiting relatives and friends across the border and showing how these three countries are interrelated. This elderly woman here, she was born in Bolivia, lived all her life in Argentina and has relatives in both countries, in Bolivia and in Paraguay. And again, you know, this evangelical campaign of visiting and going there. And sometimes they rent a truck in Argentina for about 30, 40 people. They rent a truck and they go by land all the way to the Paraguayan Chaco in order to visit the relatives and have these evangelical encounters, sometimes more political encounters of political orga indigenous organizations. But nowadays, really the strength is through the pre presence of the evangelical church in which there are you know, massive meetings outdoors of, of these practices and, and, and these relations across across the border. So really I see evangelism as a here as a very strong force, as a sense of continuity, which is different from politics. Politics sometimes is different, difficult to sustain because of the, for them, uh, the, the influence of political parties, the difficulties of getting together. But if with evangelism, there is this, this very strong sense of connection and again of transnational connection. So this continues, these, these encounters, of course, now, not now during the pandemic, but what they have in, now is a lot of radios, radio stations in which they can you know, transmit programs and, and be in contact with their relatives and friends from across, across the border. So I find in this, uh, this sense of uh, transnational connections and these multi-territorial forms of life, a source of affirmation of their very diasporic indigeneity and the reinforcement of kinship ties constantly. Sorry, there's noise here. People, young people walking outside. And in the evangelical church, a constant source of support and cohesion. So really what remains to be seen in the future is uh, what happens with younger generations? What will the younger generation do about this? Will they become more urbanized? Will they uh, continue to connect uh, across the border with, with Bolivia and with Paraguay? Thank you. Terrific, thank you so much for uh, three inspiring presentations. Um, lots of different themes that give us an introduction to the complexity of the Chaco region, certainly. I would like to invite people to ask questions um, and um, would be great to raise your hand um, and unmute yourself and ask questions. I think we have done well in the past of collecting three questions um, and then hand back to the presenters for answers so we get a rhythm. Um, questions, comments?
hopefully complexity doesn't silence people. Or perhaps too much information at once also. A lot of information, that's for sure. Um, yeah, Stephanie, would you like to start? I'll try. I always hope to have a little more time to like let things percolate, but I, uh, sure. I, I'll try to jump in. Um, hi, I'm Stephanie Grader. I'm one of the uh, faculty members in Latin American Studies, and I work on issues of extractivism, um, mining, and health in Peru. So it's very fascinating to see a lot of really intersecting issues, um, actually through all the talks, really. Um, but of course, I have a more of um, uh, a question for um sorry i'm like i'm bad with names and now i'm like struggling to find what was the name of the woman who spoke about uh uh extraction most uh specifically hi 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 it was great to hear about your work and um really i hope we have a chance to talk sometime because there's a lot of interesting overlap between um our work but i wanted to like ask if you might be able to elaborate a little bit more about um like I was, I was totally fascinated by the way that you described um, sort of the ways in which histories of um, of extraction and economy and labor conditions uh, intersect with sort of um, unexpected uh, responses to contemporary neo extractive um, uh, enterprises. And I wondered if you, um, I imagine you do so in your paper, um, but if you wanted to elaborate more on sort of what types of what types of scenarios arise from the, the, that dynamic that you described in terms of intersections with perhaps like environmental NGOs or other, um, you know, sort of anti-extractive uh, 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 groups? And, and um, I'm just sort of uh, curious how that is being negotiated, um, whether there are sort of um, ways of incorporating uh, labor and livelihood into um uh sort of uh resistance to all of the harms that you described that's produced through neo extraction um and sort of to take those concerns of the communities that you described really seriously um so you may have covered some of that in the talk I had a little trouble hearing during uh, parts of your talk so my apologies if you you already addressed this very explicitly but i'd love to hear more um if you if you are up for it Um, Thank you, Stephanie. I wonder if we if we uh, should hand over to Mercedes straight, or if we wait for a minute, um, or if I maybe um, get my own little qu first question in there at this point. Um, maybe I'd, I'd, I'd ask a, a quick question about the fascinating subject of religion um, and and. Um, evangelicals in or the the uh, con conversion practices um, that uh, that you talked about Sylvia I wonder if you look at this as a form of community cohesion how problematic this is as a subject that is both continuity and change because it involves um, new religious practices also right religious practices that then become tools of creating a continuity and perhaps you could speak a little more about the tensions that are involved there thank you any other question for now before we hand over to mercedes carly please Hello, um, my name is Carly and I was a Peace Corps volunteer living in Badawai for two and a half years. So it was really exciting to hear about um, the just everything that you talked about in the Chaco. Um, I really enjoyed hearing everything that you all had to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Um, my question is about just how did you decide on this. I, I came a little bit late, so my apologies if you already mentioned this, but I'm curious about how you all decided on these specific topics to study and research and write about. That's my question. Thank you, Carly. I will hand 
over to maybe we'll start with Mercedes since the first first question was for you and um, then everybody jump in please. Well, thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm not sure if I can answer <laughs> properly your, your question uh, is, uh, I don't know, maybe we, we need to talk longer when you want. Um, my, I, when I went to Chaco, to the Chaco province in Argentina for the first time, um, I, I live in Buenos Aires. I, I read on the newspaper that uh, soybean expansion uh, was taking a lot of indigenous land. And so I went there looking for resistance, really. Like with this idea, okay, people will be uh, defending their territories. And that was not what I, I, I saw. Like, I, I mean, there was resistance, but there was like other kind of resistance. They were uh, asked protesting for other things and in other places like the Mokovi area uh, they weren't protesting at all so um, I was a bit concerned uh, first and then um, I realized that um, when people because I, I wasn't really interested at the beginning in, in the past. It was something that came in my world like later with the, the different uh, visits that I did. So, and, and I realized that when they described like my, my, the answer I was were looking for were in, in, in the, the story they told me about the past. So I started to listen to people and they, they started to just, to say what they like about the, the previous era or just call, as I call it, cotton period uh, and what they miss about that. And I started to realize that that was um, strongly, strongly related to the way in which they, they understood or, or they, yeah, they perceive the problems they are facing now related with soybean and that's it's about memory but of course it was not only that um, and I couldn't really uh, present the my whole work but um, you can see for instance in the place where I found more resistance there is a stronger presence of um, uh, left political parties uh, and that's important, of course, <laughs> is, is uh, in in the way they organize and they they organize also uh, block roads and and in the in the other community where there is no resistance at all, there is a stronger presence of traditional political parties and also evangelical churches. And so, um, I think. Uh, I think it's a combination of, of the history of the community, but also of the new actors and uh, that are in the territory nowadays. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I'll be in touch. I'll send you an email. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Mercedes. Um, so Sylvia and Paola, I think you are, um, okay, I'm just gonna let you chime in there. Sure. Well, regarding evangelism, we could talk about it for hours. And but what would ask, why would an imposed religion that asks people to transform completely their life generate cohesion and so much identification? Why would that happen? You know, it's asking everything from people. Leave your past. All your past was evil and satanic, as they sometimes tell them. And you have to change forever everything in your life. Well, uh, I think there are many reasons. One was that one has to look at it historically what was happening with indigenous peoples in the, night, in the early 1900s when a lot of missionaries come and they were under the attack of, of the military, basically military campaigns against them, uh, labor exploitation, terrible loss of territory, it, it, all kind it, racism, discrimination, you know, all these factors, a lot of alcoholism was going on. And suddenly you know, there's this religion that's bringing salvation. 
that's telling, you know, under this, your life will be better and you will be protected. That the protection that missionaries, which were foreigners, they were not Argentine or Paraguayan or Bolivian, they were European, Swedish and Norwegian, uh, many of them in Americans, were bringing, uh, British, bringing protection to the people. We will build these missions where you will have schools and where you will have health posts and you will be protected from this. And there will be a, a, a labor a work and the word of the Lord will save you from this terrible past and, and alcoholism and all kinds. Of, so I'm really synthesizing it. And it's, you know, obviously more, much more complex, but there's also something about evangelism that's more horizontal and it's not as hierarchical as the Catholic church. So that's a long, another theme. It's long to talk about. So people really identify with this because they could build their own churches. They could be their own pastors after they got converted, they didn't need any more Europeans or Americans. So this brought this sense of these are our churches. In some cases, it meant maintaining their languages. It depends on continuing your Bibles were translated in their languages, the songs and the hymns and the prayer, everything was in their languages. So it's the sense of this is our church. This is not a foreign thing. So I think that really is what brings so much cohesion and this sense of salvation, you know, this evil thing about alcoholism and all this is gone because we have something that's safe and that gives us a sense of a civilization in quotation marks is the right way to dress, to behave, to be clean, to be part of modernity and of, you know, more accepted by national society, by white society, let's say, that that I think that's some of the, the one of the reasons you know of this why would people so I, I wonder it all the time when in the field you know why would you give up all your everything that you you believe when when something is, seems so imposed and so full of prohibitions and people don't see it that way at all they see it as a sort as they tell as a source of joy we are better with evangelism that we were before. So, you know, there's all kinds of things we could we could go on and on about that. So I, I hope that responds to, to so your question. I thank you so much. Absolutely. Well, it raises some more questions, sort of a negotiating strategy also to make some adjustments to keep some essential characteristics alive, right? Um, yes, and then of course, I, I don't have to, a lot of them believe in shamanism. So they will tell you shamans are evil and are satanic and diabolic and all these kinds of words, and they will go to the shaman as well. So when people are tremendously ill, they will go to shamans and they say, no, you know, I believe in the Bible. And so people negotiate these things at, at the same time, that which is interesting. Paola, Great. Thank you so much. Yes, Paola. Yeah, uh, thank you, Carly, for your question. It's wonderful to know you were in Paraguay. Uh, I think uh, for me it was uh, on my in my case I I have written about the commodification of Ayoreo sexuality but I haven't include uh, the health aspect of the the, the situation of health uh, in relation to their practices so I thought that was something urgent that needed to be addressed and and talked about and I really uh, wanted to connect that to uh, the multicultural reforms in Paraguay, which is also another broader topic that as, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, hasn't really been explored or, or written about uh, in, in, the, in, in the US academy, right? We don't hear much when we hear about those processes, we, we hear about other countries in the region, but not Paraguay. So I wanted to link this. And more broadly, uh, I think we, we in a way tr um, is, uh, included scholars that could present uh, different realities on different indigenous groups living in the three countries, right? So, so we try to look for that diversity, but very importantly also uh, for, our, for our book was the fact that we would include scholars whose work usually do not circulate in the US Academy because they are written in Spanish, right? So that was a crucial aspect of this collaborative work. And, and this is why we're so happy because we actually put in conversation scholars from um, the global north with scholars from the global south, right? And so I think that is something that we're, the three of us are very proud about having achieved. 
I don't know if Celia or Mercedes wants to. No, no. not much to, to add. Great, thank you. Other questions, comments? We have a few more minutes and can take more questions. Stephanie. Sorry, happy to defer if other questions come up, um, but I've been really, uh, really enjoyed all these talks. So I do have a little for, uh, queue Please. of questions coming up. So um, one thing I was just like, I was wondered if you wanted to speak to more was sort of the, the what you talked about at the beginning in terms of the sort of lack of, uh, of English uh, written um, scholarship on the Chaco region. And I wondered if like through this process, you have developed sort of, um, any sort of collective understandings. I'm, I'm totally fascinated with like what regions of the world like garner the attention of other places at certain moments of history um, and sort of geopolitical context. And I wondered whether the sort of neglect of the Chaco region has been uh, sort of analyzed as well through this process and how you have started to think of ways to communicate to particularly like English speaking audiences, but perhaps others too about the sort of vital uh, need to for us to like to to know more about this part of the world. So maybe that's a that's a terrific question. In South America, the two great areas of research for anthropology have been and still are the Andean region and Amazonia. All the scholarship, well, or eighty percent of the scholarship, <clears throat> is at these two big regions. You have regions like Patagonia, for instance. There are very unknown to American scholars or English <laughs> scholars. There's a lot of, of course, published for these areas. So why are these areas so important, the Andean and Amazon? <clears throat> it has to do with, to me, how Europeans and American scholars have developed the research in these areas. <clears throat> so when you have teams and traditions ranging from Levi-Strauss in the 1930s, <clears throat> going to, you know, to the Amazon, to all the research in, in the Andean region <clears throat> and the construction of theoretical work and finding a, a depth, let's speak it that way, it's, although I think it's not that way, of theoretical research and also the exoticism of the research. <laughs> Honestly, I think exoticism has played a major role in this. It is not as exotic to go to that chuckle, like, you know, this dry flat land. <laughs> what? No, it's exotic to go to Amazonia. You know, it's a thrilling, this imagery of this complicated kinship systems, mythologies, which you have exactly the same in the Chaco. You have that complicated mythologies, the complicated kinship system and all this. But I think it, it's the way it has been imagined that's why we talk about reimagining. Uh, imagined in, in scholarship, the number of people that have conducted research there and the difference in numbers of European and um, American scholars doing research in the Czech which is very few. I mean, we, can, we know we can cut them. However, we have a lot of local scholars that have conducted research in the area. And again, it's the politics of publication. In what language do you publish? You know, if you don't publish in English, it's, I mean, honestly, it's, you, you don't get materials known around the world. So this is why, you know, publishing in English gives so, it grants so much power in, in, in the power of, of academia. So there are several ethnographies by American and, and Latin American scholars in English about the Chaco, like, um, Lucas de Cires, Gordillo, Mario Blaser, who have published in English, Paola has published in English research, but it's, you know, it's reason, and again, it's not this image that we have of exoticism and complexity, uh, that it, and, and, and a lot of it also dialogues with, for instance, uh, Melanesian anthropology and, uh, uh, you know, that, the, the kinds of work that, done in Melanesia and, and that part of the world that the complexity of kinship systems and things like that. So I think that's one of the reasons that, that it hasn't been 
as important because you say, you know, Americans and Europeans go everywhere to do research, everywhere in the world. And you go around the chat, we well, don't meet that many. You know, Paola maybe knows, but don't you meet that many Americans uh, at all? I mean, in Argentina, you never see Americans in, in, in villages and communities. So, what, you know, what's at stake there? And I think so much it has to do with this, you know, the politics of academia and, and, the, and the imagination of I think Kali had her hand up for a while. Uh, Kali. Uh, yes, I do have another question. Um, so the areas where you all were doing your research, um, there are a lot of different languages that people speak there. And so I'm wondering, um, how did you, how were you able to communicate with people? Um, because there's, there's Guarani, of course, in Paraguay, and then there's like multiple dialects of there's just so many uh, languages. And so how did you how did you figure all of that out? Did you need a translator with you or how did that work? Paola? Well, uh, I, I, in my specific case, uh, the Ayoreo speak the Ayoreo language, which is a Samuco linguistic family, one of the five linguistic families, Guarani is one of them too. And, and so I have had a long-term relationship with the Ayoreo since the early 2000s. So I learned the language, but I had tons of teachers and continue to have them. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not, not, not perfect or fluent enough, but I, 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 I have made an effort to try to learn the language. In the Paraguayan Chaco, I would say that Guarani has become a lingua franca for many indigenous groups, uh, but the Ayoreo do not speak. Most Ayoreo would actually speak more Castellano than, uh, than Guarani. Mercedes? Yes, well, in my case, um, in, in Chaco province, uh, Mokovi and Com, they speak uh, Spanish uh, and, and of course their languages, but um, yeah, we, we talk in Spanish. Mm. Right. Um, I think we have a little more time for a question and if nobody else has a pressing question, I will take the space, I think, because I would like to, to know from Paola a little more for, about the about the women you study, the women sex workers and their own sense of themselves and how that changes over time. So I see a, a tension between, and correct me if I'm wrong, a certain sense of empowerment that they feel by making decisions about what they do, but also a compromised hmm, situation through health and violence. How do they negotiate that? Yeah, so, so it's a, 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 I, I would define their, their practices, a, the, I, well, the commodification of their sexuality uh, has a history prior to contact with uh, with the surrounding society, and they they have taken that over and have, with the uh, arrival of the market economy, monetized those intimate relations. And I think, in a way, I argue that this empowers them as it opens spaces that are due to the discrimination they are not allowed to enter in uh, in the context of the Mennonite colonies. So these practices in a way give them certain autonomy and empowers them. But uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, health issues and violence, they are very, uh, they are very much limited to the structures and, and actually are being uh, uh, victims, right, of, of, uh, of, of structural discrimination and racism in the region. And there's a lot of silence around that because if uh, because most health providers in the region uh, belong to the Mennonite community so uh, this is a taboo to speak about what can we do or or what what would be actions or programs that we could engage with with them in order to actually uh, change the situation for them and and it's, it's amazing to see it long term how up to the present there hasn't been any comprehensive project 
like approaching them and trying to to alleviate their situation, right? Especially health wise. And so, um, yeah, it's it's really sad actually. But is the sort of silence surrounding the subject also preventing them from organizing, from talking amongst themselves, from creating alternative structures if nobody else comes to so, create so, one? Thank you for that question. So actually, in terms of protecting themselves they from violence, they will take some, some specific measures, but in, in small groups and just these young women or even their parents, you you would actually see sometimes parents going out at night just to keep an eye on their daughters to make sure that they are not uh, that violence doesn't occur, but but not at a more uh, you know uh, in terms of of, of receiving a more comprehensive service that doesn't happen right so but but they are but but they are also the problem is also that there's a lot of shame also uh, as a result of the situation or some acts of violence that women really don't want to talk about and share that so there is no really a, a sense of community or talking about what goes on in terms of of violence and um, uh, another way that they have dealt with the situation Situation, especially uh, pregnancies, which are very common, unwanted pregnancies, you have uh, girls giving out in, ado in adoption the kids, right, as an alternative to um, to having to raise them. And so, so they, they there are small ways in which they are finding a way around the situation, but definitely there needs to be a more structured. A plan or program, especially from governmental agencies, and and it feels that the Mennonites have such an economic power in the region, and because of moral issues, uh, governmental agencies are really not pushing for those programs to be implemented. Right. Thank you for that. I I'm always amazed and horrified by the shame that surrounds violence Men, while it hurts or kills people you can't talk about it is one of those tremendous and horrifying contradictions um i'm looking forward to reading the chapter with much attention all your chapters and the book so uh, thank you so much for introducing these inter interesting subjects to us and i'm sure other people are equally inspired to go get the book discuss and analyze and learn more about the region i just want to say thanks again on behalf of the center for latin american studies and the faculty and staff here in tucson we really appreciate your presentation and uh, the talk about the book and and like edwiga said we look forward to getting a copy and uh reading it here